Be inspired, supported, and empowered. This is the Global Healthy Living Foundation Podcast Network. Patients will say to me, oh, I don't want a generic drug. You know, I have a hard time with generic drugs. And I tell them, this is not a generic. A biosimilar is a copy of the originator drug. Welcome to Breaking Down Biosimilars, a podcast that brings light to biosimilars and helps you better understand the role they play in your healthcare now and in the future. I'm Zoe Rothblatt. And I'm Connor Mertens. Both of us are patient advocates and community outreach managers at the Global Healthy Living Foundation. During this series, we cover everything you need to know about biosimilars, what they are, how they work, and who should take them. We also hear from a few people who've been taking biosimilars about their own experiences. And we cover some of the common myths about biosimilars and try to separate fact from fiction. So Connor, we've talked a lot about how the adoption of biosimilars has been a bit sluggish since they were first introduced in the U.S. in 2016. And that's even though it's estimated that a strong biosimilar market could save the U.S. as much as $54 billion over the next 10 years. Billion with a B. So what's stopping the market from growing? Well, skepticism for one thing. It can be a long road filled with trial and error to find the right medication that works for you. So when patients do find the right one, there's a sense of loyalty to that medication, which you know is fair when you think about all that we as patients have to go through. And many people are convinced that if they're already doing okay on their biologic medication, switching to a biosimilar could cause harmful side effects. Well, something has to be causing all that skepticism. Yep, you're right. What's causing it is a lot of the misinformation that began circulating when biosimilars first showed up. But the good news is that the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, or the FDA, has begun cracking down. In February of 2020, they issued a joint statement with the Federal Trade Commission saying they intended to combat false or misleading statements about biosimilars. Still, once misinformation begins to circulate, it can take a long time to counteract. So in this episode, we're going to be looking at several common myths about biosimilars. And as we do that, we'll try to dispel those myths with the help of a few experts. Dr. Simon Helfgott has been a rheumatologist for 35 years. He's the Director of Education and Fellowship Training at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. I asked him to explain some of the common myths that he hears about biosimilars. One is patients will say to me, I don't want a generic drug. You know, I have a hard time with generic drugs. And I tell them, this is not a generic. A biosimilar is a copy of the originator drug. I think one of the concerns I had, and many rheumatologists I know had this many years ago, we were concerned that when biosimilars would come out, they would be made by these small companies overseas in factories, that the FDA wouldn't be able to inspect all the time, and that they might come in really cheap, but they might be dangerous because the quality control would be lacking. That's totally untrue. The companies that are making biosimilar products are companies that also make branded products. These are all the big players in biological drug manufacturing. So they all have the knowledge and the capability. So to me, it's just a matter of pick the one that you can get that's the best price and go with it. And I think that that's the first myth that I would like to debunk. Dr. Helfgott also thinks there's a lot of hesitancy among patients about this thing called transferability, which is switching to a biosimilar as a less costly alternative to a biologic. I think there was concern that can I transfer after 10 years of being on this drug to that drug? Is there going to be any impediment or toxicity or allergic reaction and so forth? Then the answer is no, there does not appear to be any of that. I would use the analogy when the biologicals came out initially, we all had great excitement about their use because they were so highly effective. But all of us were wondering, well, wait, something's going to happen. You know, we've only used these drugs for one or two years. Let's wait five or 10 years and see what happens. Well, guess what? We're now into 20 plus years of using biological drugs, and there have really been no additional surprises. We know what the toxicities, what the risks are, but they really have not changed compared to what we knew 20 plus years ago. So I say the same thing will apply to biosimilars. We feel confident with their efficacy, with their side effect profile, and with their benefits. And I don't expect to see any surprises. And here's another perspective. Dr. Robert Popovian is Chief Science Policy Officer here at the Global Healthy Living Foundation. And he told me that many people are convinced that biosimilars won't save money. 
That's another misinformation that is out there that, oh, you're not going to save any money. That is not true. They're definitely less expensive. Even if you look at average sales price, which is at net prices you can get into this market, they are lower. Now, we can argue what is lower. Is it 10, 20, 30, 40%? But they're lower. You still have some cost savings. Even if they're not lowering like more than 20% or 10% lower than the originated biologic, their presence has created a dynamic in the marketplace, a competitiveness that has lowered the price for everyone. So it is important to note that when biosimilars are introduced, they suppress prices for everyone, not only for themselves, but also the competition. The originated biologic prices keep coming down. And Dr. Popovian goes on to talk about a myth that's cropped up only recently. The new one that's been bantied about by certain folks incessantly for the last year and a half or two years or three years is this concept that biologics in general are natural monopolies. And it's absolutely not true. They're wrong and they're providing misinformation. I don't know why for this purpose. Natural monopolies exist when you cannot create a competitive market. In the case of biologics, we have created a competitive market and competition through biosimilars. Now, we can argue that biosimilar adoption has not been optimal in certain markets. But right now, formularies in the United States are built based on which drug gains the most rebates and fees rather than based on safety, efficacy, and cost. Think about it formularies that we've been told by insurers and PBMs to be based on cost effectiveness are not based on cost effectiveness. They're based on how much rebates and fees they collect. We need to get away from that. And that's what these folks that keep incessantly talking about biologics being natural monopolies and we need to do price controls are dead wrong and they're missing the mark. If you want to fix it, fix the market. So not only it helps the biologics market, but it will help subsequently alternative medicines that they come into the market at lower prices to get a foothold instead of being blocked by the insurers and pharmacy benefit managers because of rebates and rebate contracting and rebate walls. So Connor, we've heard about four myths today. Let's wrap it up. The first, biosimilar quality control is lacking. The second, switching to a biosimilar from the biologic will lead to a bad reaction. The third is that biosimilars don't save money. And finally, the biologics are monopolies and we can't create competition. And look, these are very real concerns, especially for patients who just wanna feel good. So I hope we've helped everyone out there gain a bit of clarity on the truth so they can make more informed decisions about their treatment plan. Me too. And given that biosimilars are still so new here in the U.S., hearing from experts like Dr. Helfgott and Dr. Popovian is really reassuring to me. On our next episode of Breaking Down Biosimilars, we'll discuss the outlook for the next few years as new biosimilar medications are approved and introduced into the U.S. market. The quality and the efficacy is all equal. The one remaining variable is the cost. And I think now that you're seeing more and more products getting FDA approval, you're going to see much more pressure for these products to come on the market. And we'll explore how more choices in the marketplace may finally begin to bring down prices for these biosimilars. We hope you learned something new about the myths and realities of biosimilars. And as always, we'd love to hear what you think. Send us an email at breakingdownbiosimilars at ghlf.org. Thanks for listening to Breaking Down Biosimilars podcast that sheds light on biosimilars and helps you better understand the role they play in your healthcare now and in the future. If you like this episode, give us a rating and write a review on Apple Podcasts. It's going to help people like you find people like us. I'm Connor Mertens. And I'm Zoe Rothblatt. See you next time. Be inspired, supported, and empowered. This is the Global Healthy Living Foundation Podcast Network.